This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. When the jury panel comes into the courtroom and the bail says, all rise, I know we're here. And it doesn't matter who they are, nobody should be above the law. A lot of us talk about that, but you've actually done it. That's how you also maintain quality control over your practice. Yeah. That's a question I get asked a lot, and here's the answer. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation. Your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Today on Trial Lawyer Nation, we have Sari Delamotte, the attorney whisperer. Mm. How are you doing today, Sari? I'm doing great. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. <laughs> so, Sari, tell us a, a little bit about what is it you do? I do many things, um, but I primarily, well, I would say I now 100% work with trial attorneys. I functioned as a presentation coach for, for years for a trial attorneys and people in the corporate world and so on and so, so forth, but just in the last year have now focused all of my work with trial attorneys, and my specialty is working with your communication and specializing in nonverbal communication. So I work with attorneys on how to present and communicate and work with their juries. And what is your background? How did you get into helping lawyers communicate with juries? That is a long story, so I'll try to make it a short one. But I have two advanced degrees in music, so a Bachelor of Music Education and a Master of Science in Teaching. And um, when I was in my master's program, my mentor, um, professor, she said, you need to go to this nonverbal communication training. And I said, why? I'm expecting, you know, all the stuff that a lot of people expect now when they come to my seminars, you know, we're going to learn how to read people's nonverbal cues and make up stories about what it is they're communicating. And um, I said, why do I have to go to this? And she said, because it's going to make you a better teacher. And, you know, you do what your mentor tells you to do. So I went to the seminar and it was nothing that I was expecting. It was actually all about how you communicate nonverbally and how you can increase your presence and charisma and all those things. And I was hooked. I just thought, whatever this is, I want to do this. And so I went and I talked to the uh, person who was doing the training. He's um, a very well-known, and it's, it's Michael Grinder, actually. His brother is John Grinder, Grinder and Bandler, the people that came up with NLP. And That's I, neuro-linguistic programming. Neuro-linguistic programming. And I said to Michael, I said, how do I get trained in this? And at that time, he said, well, are you a teacher? I said, I'm a, I'm a you know, at music school, but I'm not like in a classroom. He's like, well, that's all that I do is train classroom teachers. And so I went home and I looked up on the website all the places he's going to be training in the next year. And I came back the next day to the training. It was a week-long training. And I said, all right, what happens if I just show up wherever you are? And <laughs> Can I observe? And he said, Sure. So on my own dime, I just flied all over the United States for about six to nine months and would observe and take notes. And then I took them to dinner and asked all the questions and really trained myself in this method and then came back and decided to start training in nonverbal communication. I mean, I literally just pivoted out of music and into the nonverbal communication realm. And it didn't make a lot of sense at the time, but now looking back, I really think that nonverbal communication and music are the two universal languages and that... You don't need training in music, for example, to enjoy it. And same goes for nonverbal communication. We all are trained to, uh, or I wouldn't say trained, we all know when our spouse is upset, for example. You don't need training in nonverbal communication. And you don't need training to know when you hear da dun da dun exactly. something bad's going to happen. Something bad's going to happen. You don't happen. have to go to music school to know that. <laughs> right. But if you want to perform music, if you want to be systematic in how you communicate nonverbally, then you absolutely need to get training. And so in that way, they're, they're very similar in terms of the universal part of, of how they're both communicative outside of actual language. And so, yeah, so that's kind of how I started. I started training teachers in the schools and how to manage their classrooms using nonverbal techniques. And then the recession hit, and I thought, well, you know, schools don't have any more money. So I adapted it for the uh, corporate world. Uh, the Oregonian here did a story on me and a lawyer called and he said, can you come and help me pick a jury on Monday morning? And I thought, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I told him that I, I would try and uh, that's really how everything started. I, I That was my second I got hooked moment. I was there and I thought, this is awesome. I totally want to do this. So how did you learn to apply what you'd learned for you know nonverbal communication in other contexts and apply that to us lawyers? 
Well, you know, it was interesting. When he asked me, that one lawyer way many years ago, to come and help him uh, uh, pick a jury, what he wanted me to do, because he had read that I work in nonverbal communication, is to come and read the body language of the jurors and tell him who to kick off and who to leave on. And obviously, you know, when I got there, I started watching the jurors, but there was nothing I could do with that. I mean, there's no credible research that says you can read nonverbal communication or body language as it's normally said out in the media and know or predict accurately what people are thinking or feeling. There's just nothing that backs that up. Even all the body language experts out there, um, <laughs> they cannot show you any research that says that's, that's available to us. So when I was there, I, I tried to watch their body language to see if I could pick up anything, but my attention kept getting pulled back to this attorney. And finally, when we were on a break, he said, what do you think? And I said, about the jurors? Nothing. You, however, we can really work with because there's some issues here. And, you know, thankfully he was so open. He's like, great, tell me. And so that's really where this was born is that all of the nonverbal skills, the ones I, whether I was teaching teachers or in the corporate world or now with lawyers, they're all the same skills. It's just the context that changes. So all I had to do really was learn the context in which you guys and gals operate in and apply all the skills I've been doing for years up until that point. But it was when I really found my first lawyer that was willing to look at himself instead of trying to focus on what the jury was doing, that that's when I fell in love with the work you guys do. And it is crazy how many times we're doing something with our hands or our facial expression or other body language or even our tone of voice, and we don't even know it. And we're giving off a message that is the opposite of what the words that we're saying is. Absolutely. And research says that if there is a mismatch between what you're saying and what you're communicating non-verbally, the listener will go with the non-verbal message every single time. You know, I ask seminar, uh, seminar attendees all the time, how many of you are aware of what you're communicating non-verbally? And most of people say, I have no idea what I'm communicating non-verbally. I say, yeah, how many of you have ever been videotaped? Almost every hand goes, you know, goes up. And I said, how many of you watched it back? And same thing. And I said, and how many of you were horrified? <laughs> yeah. It's like, it is horrifying. Not because, you know, the hair or the weight or all the things we tend to think of. Because we have no idea the weird things that we're doing non-verbally. That's why it's so shocking. We have no idea. I'm pulling my hair. I'm pulling this. I'm doing whatever. And that's a problem, I think, not knowing how you communicate nonverbally when nonverbal communication is the majority of the message. Wow, if you really want to be a great communicator, which I think trial attorneys, that should be your number one concern, um, you have to look at the nonverbal component of the message or you're missing a huge piece. So I know I first, I'm out here working with you here in Portland, Oregon. Yes, uh, welcome to my town. Because I heard about you from Eric Penn, because you did some good work with Eric. He's a prior guest we had. And, uh, I love Eric. Sung your praises. And then I totally got hooked on your podcast, From Hostage to Hero. Uh, who are some other lawyers, if you don't mind me asking, that you've worked with that maybe someone's heard of? <laughs> well, you guys have probably heard of Rick Friedman. Um, so I, I really credit my entire career, not my entire career, but my start to Rick. Um, very early on, after I'd worked with that one lawyer, I started working a lot of criminal cases. That was a criminal case, and now hardly work criminal. I, I still do, but most of my work is with plaintiff attorneys. And um, the inner circle called. <laughs> it just happened to right be at the beginning part of my career with lawyers, and they said, we're looking for someone to talk about nonverbal communication, and would you come and speak to us? And at that time, I didn't even know who the hell the inner circle was. I mean, of course, now I know they're the hundred, you know, top 100 plaintiff attorneys in the, in the United States. And so I went and I spoke. And you know how when you speak and you have that line of people waiting to talk to you at the end? So I, you know, I was sitting there talking to people. And the very first person in line comes up to me and he says, I have this case in Las Vegas and I'd like you to come down and help me pick a jury and, and watch my nonverbals and tell me how I can improve. And, oh, by the way, I wrote a book and I'm going <laughs> to send it to you. And I thought, oh, how good for him. You know, he wrote a book. And so a week later, you know, on becoming a trial lawyer shows up <laughs> and it's Rick Friedman. And, you know, at that point in my career, I didn't know that who the hell Rick Friedman was. But it just, it's so interesting to me that it's always, and this is just proven true now in the last nearly 15 years in working with lawyers, it's always the best lawyers that show up on my doorstep. You know, when I started working in the educational realm, it was the same thing. I would go in and to the schools and I'd suggest they do a training and that with the training they would get coaching. For their teachers and 
they would say, great, that sounds wonderful. And I said, here's the caveat. I will not coach anyone who does not want to be coached. And they'd say, well, why is that? And I said, because it doesn't work. And they said, well, what, what should we do then? I said, Let's, why don't we just put a sign-up sheet? I'll do the training. Whoever wants coaching can come and sign up. But well, the first school, the principal after the training looked over that list and she said, these teachers don't need coaching. These are the best teachers in the school. And I thought, well, how interesting is that? Until it happened every single school. And now it happens with trial attorneys. It's not, it's not that, you know, the beginning trial attorneys aren't good or whatever. What I'm saying is, is that it's always the people who've been in this for a while and are always looking to take it to the next level are the people that call and constantly want to be learning. And I love that. So Rick Freeman was one of my, my first clients, big clients. And of course, having my name um, with him has always been wonderful. So I've spoken on stage with Rick at Take Back the Courtroom, with Randy McGim, with Roger Dodd. You may, uh, mentioned Eric Penn. A lot of great attorneys. I'm all over the United States um, working with attorneys or they come here to Portland to our, our studios here to work on their voir dire, which I've actually become known now as an expert in voir dire. I have found that is a common, and all the, the great attorneys for a time, that they all are constantly trying to learn something new. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of how they got to be where they are. Although in defense of the younger lawyers, I mean, one, I was taking courses as a younger lawyer, but frankly, I didn't have the time or the money to come out or the bandwidth, I think. You're learning so much as a young attorney, for sure. And the other thing is you need to know the basics of mm -hmm. how to get your evidence in, how what the rules are before you can work on what your tone of voice needs to be or where to stand. Or, I mean, you got to learn to walk before you learn to run. Exactly. I mean, you're not in any position to come out and work with me when you're still trying to get the basics of all that. I mean, me messing with your, your gesturing and your stance and your voice, uh, that's just, that's just going to add to the mess <laughs> that the first three years of lawyering already creates for you. So yeah, for sure. But I, I also want to point out that you know, there's a difference that I see because I think a lot of lawyers are interested in learning different things. But there's a difference between the greats and everybody else in that the greats aren't going from trial consultant to trial consultant to CLE to CLE and trying to pick up every newest, greatest formula. You know, here's what's going to make me win. It is, comes from a totally different place. It comes from a personal development stance, from a place of I want to become the best version of myself versus there's an answer out there, and I haven't found it yet, so I need to keep trying. I see that all the time, and that just frankly makes me sad and tired for all of the trial attorneys that thinking there's some answer outside of themselves instead of looking at my work or anyone else's work as a way to grow who they are personally and become the best version of themselves. Because unfortunately, there is no magic formula or magic set of words or gestures. If there was, I'd love to give it to you. But trial is unscripted and... It, you know, jurors will always be unknown until you get to know them. There's no formula to, to be able to think on your feet and be present and real and in the moment. And the other side gets to fight back. Absolutely. And they're working hard, too. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Was it Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think that's true, too, is that we need to redefine what it is that we're doing. You know, I think if you go into this thinking the only acceptable outcome is to win at trial, then you're going to have a long, unhappy career as a trial attorney. We need to redefine, first of all, what winning means and, and define that you know, when you said the other side fight back, fights back. That's what you're there to do. You're there to fight. You're not there to win. I mean, winning is great and that's a wonderful bonus, but you can't control whether you win or not. And so you have to let that go and define your success differently, which is I went to fight. That you can always be successful at. And I think that's really going to change the experience for you as a trial attorney instead of going, when is, when is the only acceptable outcome? And then I keep going from CLE to CLE trying to find the formula, and there is no formula. That's interesting. You know, I've, I heard you say that on your podcast, and I, and I was really thinking, I was doing the run, mm -hmm. uh, and so I had time after your podcast where I was still running, so I gave it a lot of thought. And on one hand, I mean, I, I definitely, I, I have a higher definition of winning than a lot of people have because my definition of winning is my client was materially better off having tried the case than not having tried the case, mm -hmm. which means I not only have to quote unquote win, mm -hmm. but my client has to do enough better than the top settlement offer to have paid any additional fees, expenses, uh, whatever else comes, uh, and, and have to have taken the time and trouble of gone through trial. So we have to do substantially better than we could have settled for me to consider it to win. Mm -hmm. It's just my own personal because yep. I think at the end of the day, it's the client's case, not mine. 
Uh, but when I detach what I am doing from winning, mm -hmm. that makes it, it's uh, almost like a Buddhist concept of detachment. It's absolutely And so uh, I'm not thinking about when I'm winning or losing, when I'm giving an opening or closing, or I'm just thinking about that human communication with that juror and about the the joy and experience of trying the case. Yeah. And then once the jury goes out, and then I start fretting and thinking about winning and losing, and I'm going nuts because I can't do anything else. But while I'm in there, you can be in the moment. I think that's the big thing. But the other thing is the detachment is, you know, you're not a bad lawyer because the jury didn't, you got a red ribbon. You know, you did got second place in the trial. You know, you, right. you, you give it everything you can. You don't have control. Uh, no, it's a lot more fun to win than to lose. Oh, sure. But you can't quit. You just go on to the next. If you try enough cases, you're going to win, you're going to lose. It's going to happen. Well, I talk all the time about how um, trial lawyering has to be bigger than winning. You have to be in this for something bigger than the win, or you're going to have a long, unhappy career. I mean, you talked about Rick Friedman's a great example. He lost a big case, the Da Vinci cases, you know, the robotic surgery. And, you know, I emailed him and I said, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about that. And he said, that's okay. We'll get him next time. Now, who's the them in that sentence, right? I mean, they <laughs> got away with their egregious behavior, the people in this case. He's not talking about them. He's talking about the bigger them. He's talking about why he's in this. If you've ever heard him speak, he is really about this crusade against corporation values taking over human values. I mean, he's not lawyering for lawyering's sake, he's in this to change the world. And I'm not saying that every trial lawyer says has to have that purpose, but that you have to have some purpose bigger than just winning. Because that, that's empty. You know, it makes me think about when you say how you define your win, is what is in your circle of concern versus your circle of influence, right? So I get that from Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, but your circle of concern is I want my client to be, you know, substantially better off. But that's not within your circle of influence. You no. can't control that. So what you can control on is being in the moment and doing the best you can at that moment. So I'm not asking you not to care or not be concerned about your client or the win or the outcome or any of that. What I'm asking you to do is to focus on what you can control because that's where the power lies. And the other hard thing is just learning to let it go. I mean, you, you mm -hmm. give it everything you can. Yep. You didn't win. What I do is I go back. This might not be the healthiest thing for some people, but I go back in. And I have probably one of the most expensive bottles of red wine I have in my, I don't necessarily need the whole thing. I try to get my wife to at least have a glass of it. And it's kind of a reminder that I'm not broke yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I have a nice meal and a glass of wine and then I go back to work and start another case. Yep. You have to have it's those over. little rituals. I think. But then, but because I'm putting that one to bed and it's over mm -hmm. and then I go to the next one and I don't think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. Unless somehow there's overturn appeal, then we'll go try to do it differently. But I just, you can't let the loss you don't want to make the same mistakes over and over and over again, but you can't let yeah. the loss haunt you or you can never get back in the arena. Yeah, there's there's a difference between learning from your mistakes and letting the saboteur voices come in and absolutely destroy you. Because it's never about the, the losing. The losing is not the problem. It's what we tell ourselves about losing that's the problem. When we lose and we tell ourselves we're a bad lawyer, what the hell are we even doing this for, so on and so forth, that's when things start to go down the rails. I lost a case is just a fact. And we add the, 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 the meaning to that fact. And nobody remembers the cases you lose. No, no one says, oh, yeah. Rick Friedman, he's a lawyer that lost that Vinci case. Right. No one says that. Exactly. And that's what I found, that uh, all the great lawyers, except for Jerry Spence, evidently never lost, hasn't lost a civil case since the 50s. Other than that, <laughs> uh, all the other lawyers have lost cases. And no one, they just remember your big wins. Right. And Absolutely. that's okay. No one talks about the time that Tom Brady did not win the Super Bowl. They talk about all the Super Bowl rings. Yeah. That's, if you just keep getting in there and fight, they remember your wins, they don't remember your losses. Absolutely. And maybe we should talk about our losses more. I mean, maybe we shouldn't make it this big shameful thing. And there's also something to look at that, too. I think that's we think it's this shameful thing. It's just losing as a part of life. You know, and we've made it this like gold standard that we have to win in order to be a good trial attorney, and that's not that's not the truth. You know, Sonia and Delisi in my office keep wanting me to do a podcast where I talk about losing and the things I've lost, and I just don't have the courage to do it yet to, uh. to go on a national stage and talk about. How, <laughs> you know, well, now I'm going to hold you to that, Michael. Well, let's go win one, and then we can talk about the loss <laughs> next. Uh, you know, I, I just I, you know, and, and it's probably weakness within me. I'm just not quite ready to go and nationally uh, talk about some of my losses yet. Um, although probably it would be useful to people to learn. You know, don't do, don't make the mistakes I made. 
Although sometimes, you know, you do everything right and your case just sucks. And you, know, you know, it's so funny because it reminds me of um, when I, we had Bill Barton on our one of our seminars here. Bill Barton, great attorney here in Oregon. And um, he wrote he, uh, Recovering for Psychological, psychological injuries. injuries. Yeah. And so he was talking about how you can't take the losses personally. And um, David Sugarman, another great attorney here in Portland, we, he, he was there and we had lunch a couple weeks later and we were talking about what Bill said. And David said to me, he said, you know, I love what Bill said, but I've also learned that you can't take the wins personally. And what, what David and Bill and Rick and all these other great attorneys know is that sometimes you lose cases you sh- totally should have won. And other times you win cases that totally should have lost. I mean, so much of this is up in the air. Yeah. And so to praise yourself for your brilliant lawyering when you win and then berate yourself when you lose just doesn't make any sense. Because it's a lot of this is just out of your control. You can only control your effort. That's it. Yeah, I learned that the juries are pretty good about bringing you back down to earth. Because early, early in my career, I got really lucky. I got a huge verdict on a case where the person got in the chiropractor for six weeks, and that was it in a regular mm-hmm. little car wreck case. And mm-hmm. I just thought I was awesome and invincible. And then, <laughs> you know, tried my next case and found out that I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, that's the thing is that we, we it's just a crapshoot. Well, sense. it isn't. It isn't because if you do, if you don't do the right things, you don't have the opportunity to get the. Big Absolutely. Case. And you are more, you can totally lose a case by not doing it right. For sure. But Absolutely. If you do everything right, part of it depends on what cases did you pick, mm-hmm. um, and part of that is just, you know, what did the other side do? What jury did you do? I mean, just just what. You know, almost every big verdict I had, we've either had some magic moment in the courtroom no one could have predicted. Exactly. There's so many variables. Or we had the defense do something that really pissed off the jury mm-hmm. that we couldn't have predicted. Absolutely. But if you don't get in there and do the right things, you're never going to... Right. You increase your chance. And that's exactly what I'm talking about, is focusing on what you can control. Right. Mm-hmm. Would you like to meet host Michael Cowan in person? If so, here's your chance. Trial Lawyer Nation is excited to invite our podcast listeners to Michael Cowan's Trucking CLE on Thursday, October 10th in San Antonio, Texas. Join us for a full day of trucking education hosted by Cowan Rodriguez Peacock. The seminar will take place at a location in downtown San Antonio right on the historic Riverwalk. We will begin at 9 o'clock a.m. and end at 4.30 p.m. The 6.75 hours of CLE will also include one hour of ethics. This is a complimentary CLE with no fee to attend. However, seating is limited to 65 plaintiff attorneys. We've received an overwhelming response to this event already and do anticipate it will reach capacity before October. So if you are interested in reserving a spot, please send us an email to podcast at triallawyernation.com. And now, back to the show. Well, I want to move on, kind of switch it up a little bit. Your podcast name uh, is From Hostage to Hero. Yep. And uh, that really struck me. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, it's my podcast name and the name of my upcoming book. Um, we knew the book was coming when we started the podcast, so they kind of go together. You know, where that came from is when I first started in this field, you know, as I said, I just had to learn the context. The skills were pretty much the same, but the context was different. So I started reading everything you guys were reading. I started attending CLEs, watching DVDs. And what I noticed after helping pick several hundred juries and reading everything that was being written is that there was one thing that no one was really talking about. And that was the idea that jurors are hostages. Right, I mean, there's a lot out there on juror decision making and bias, and you know, all kinds of stuff on on how they think and what they think. But nobody was talking about the elephant in the room, which is they don't even want to be there in the first place, and they're forced to do it anyway. And in my mind, until you can get jurors to come alongside and want to participate, we can't even do any of half the things that the books are suggesting you do. And it's great stuff out there, don't get me wrong. But the jurors have to willingly want to participate for half of that stuff to even work. And so that's where I set out to kind of fix this communication dilemma. (laughs) It's going, how do we get jurors to want to participate? And to understand that, we have to first understand 
why they're hostages and, or that they even are hostages in the first place. And so that's the idea from Hostage to Hero. You know, kind of in the book, I talk about the idea of what a hero is. You know, a hero is someone who takes selfless action that benefits someone else. I mean, isn't that what we're asking jurors to do? We're asking them to take action for some person that they don't even know, that at least at, at what they think that doesn't benefit them at all, right? We know it does ultimately in terms of safety and all the kinds of things that lawsuits uh, help in terms of our communities. But at least on the on the face of it, it doesn't seem to affect the juror's life at all. And that, So that's what we're really asking them to do. We're asking them to be heroes. But when they first come into the courtroom, they're hostages. And we've got to move them to heroic action systematically instead of just asking them to do it, right? We've got to get them out of their hostage state. In, in the book, I talk about how it's kind of like, you know, man's walking down the street, he sees a woman at a window, and there's smoke coming out, she's holding a baby, and he just springs into action, right? He jumps up the fire escape, he rescues her. That's heroic action, right? Compare that to same scenario, but now the man walking down the street, there's another man that comes up, puts a gun to his head, and says, go save that woman, right? He goes up there, he force, you know, forces him to do it. He, he still saves the woman, but the act isn't heroic. Why? Because he didn't voluntarily do it. That's the piece I think we're missing. In, and, and trial attorneys don't understand, is we've got to get jurors to voluntarily want to participate and then and only then does their verdict become heroic because it's something they chose to do. So how do we do that? <laughs> how much time do you got? Well, for me... You can answer that question as much time as you want. <laughs> I don't know that trial guys would love that. They prefer you um, get the book. Uh, no, I will, I will give you the overview. Well, the, the biggest thing I think you have to, to do is first understand that they are hostages and, and understand and accept that as, as a reality, that they can't choose to not be there. I mean, they can, but there, there are definite consequences to that choice. In theory. Yeah, yeah so it, they, they're there against their will. And if you understand that, I think when, I, when I'm in a seminar with attorneys and I say, who's the enemy at trial? I almost always get the jurors. Really? You know? Yes, they yell the jurors. And I think this is a prevailing attitude. I think maybe we don't want to admit it, but we secretly, we meaning trial attorneys, I'm not a trial attorney, but I, I feel like I'm one of you now. Um, we secretly think they're the problem with this whole thing. Right, they're they're the reason why we lose. They they don't get it. They don't understand. They're amateurs. They're blah blah blah. And so when we when we ha hold that, and this is this is evidenced by the exclusionary voir dire that most attorneys are trained to do. Right, we walk in and we say to the jury, you know, I want you to trust me, and I want you to believe in me, and all the while inside we're going, who here is out to kill me? <laughs> right, and and we've got our gun trained on the wrong person. They're not the enemy. These are these hostages that have been corralled in there. They're scared. They don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't know why they're there. And we're, we're now we're just another person who's against them. And that, even if we don't say that, we are going to communicate that non-verbally. And so I think that's the first step is to recognize that they're hostages looking for a leader. They're looking to get out of this hostageness. And in their mind, the only way to get out of it is to literally get out of it. So that's why you see nearly 50% of every jury pool trying to slither their way out of jury selection because they're like, I don't want to be here. Get me out of here. Their fight or flight is absolutely uh, activated, right? And that's why I think ch cause challenges are often the jurors that just don't want to be there, not the jurors that are bad for you. Absolutely right, Michael. And the ones that are bad for you want to be there because they, if they really, really, really think it's the problem with the system, they want to go fix it by getting on there. They're not going to let themselves off for cause. Right. Cause challenges are just a doorway for hostages to leave. It's not a, this is a bad juror and, you know, I, yay for me, I got them kicked off. It's, they see an out, they're going to take it. Okay. So that's the first step. But the, the, the real thing to, after you recognize that, is that you can't skip levels, right? What we tend to do is we walk in and we say, you guys are so important and we really want you to take action for us and blah, blah. It's too early. All that is too early. It's kind of like, you know, when you, um, I've never done this. I, mean, I think you and I are too old for this. But now the big thing is online dating, right? <laughs> so especially for women, the first thing, first consideration is safety. Right. So when I meet someone, if I'm online dating, I'm going to go somewhere public so, you know, I can escape, I can scream, whatever, if this guy's a psychopath. Right. So that's the same thing with jurors. The first thing you need to do is create safety for them, that you are not a threat. 
Once you create safety, the next thing you need to do is to engage them with you and the material, right? So then you, they're like, okay, I know this person isn't going to hurt me or harm me. They've actually given me some useful information. I'm a little bit more willing to hear what I'm, what I'm here to do. So now we start engaging them with us and the material. And that's our voir dire process, right? Now, once they get engaged, now they can move to commitment. So now they can say, okay, now I'm going to hear your opening. I know what the case is a little bit about. Now you're going to put it all together for me. By the end of opening, we know that most jurors have made a decision one way or the other. That's where they commit. It's not until closing now that they can take action, right? So those are the four steps. It's create safety, engage the jurors, get them to commit, and then take action. What we tend to do is just try to jump right to action. And that's like going to our coffee date, talking for two minutes, and then getting down on one knee and asking the person to marry us. And the person, the cow's thinking, are you a psycho? No, I don't even know you. So we can't skip levels with jurors either. We have to systematically move them through those four levels. And as you learn how to do that, you'll see that the jury starts changing and, 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 and morphing right before your eyes so that when you get to closing, really what you're doing is just empowering them to take action. You don't have to convince them of anything if you actually follow the steps. And I don't think we have the power to convince people of things anyway. Mm -mm. Nope. All we can do is match up with their already preconceived ideas. Absolutely. So what do we do to create safety then? So there's a variety of things to do to create safety. In the book, I talk about um, the three components of any message. So there's the content, that's the what you're saying. There's the delivery, that's how you're saying it. And then there's the reception to how to read whether it's happening. So in each of the sections, safety, engagement, commitment, action, in the book you'll find that here's what you need to say to create safety, here's what you need to do to create safety, and here's how you, what you can read to see if jurors are feeling safe. So just a couple of things for, on safety. I mean, a big one is breathing. And it's funny when I, when I say breathing, people go, what do you mean breathing? And I say, well, you need to be doing it. And they're like, well, I am. I'm like alive. I'm not dead. That's not what I mean. I don't mean you need to be living. I mean you have to be in control of your breathing. You know, I think back to um, Captain Sullenberger and the whole flight of landing the plane in the Hudson River, right? And so he came on the intercom right before they hit the water, and he said three words to the passengers. And if you read the reports, nearly every passenger said, you know, I felt calm immediately. I knew we were in good, good hands. When I asked my seminar attendees, what were those three words? They don't know. They're like, I'm not sure. What, what were they? And I said, you know what the three words were? Brace for impact. So I say, how on earth are those words comforting? <laughs> and those are about the last three words that I or you or anyone else on a plane would ever want to hear. Listen, it's not what he said. It's how he said it. He had control of his breathing. He said, brace for impact. And the message that the jurors, or not the jurors, that the, the um, passengers on the plane received was, I've got this. Like, brace for impact. Brace for impact. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So breathing affects everything. It affects your tone of voice. It affects how you move in the courtroom. And when you are not breathing, you activate your own fight or flight response. And when you're in fight or flight, you're now in survival mode. And if we're talking about leadership, no one's going to follow anyone who's only looking out for themselves. So breathing, at the very least, communicates, I'm not scared, therefore you don't need to be scared. I've got this. I've got you. And I think one of the first things that I work with my uh, trial attorneys is on how are you breathing and how, are you, how are, are, do you have control over that? And people always come to me after and say, I'm totally buying this. It's awesome. So like, how do I do this? And I say, you're doing it already. The point is, is that you're not aware of your breathing. So you need to bring more awareness to it so that you can access that good breathing when you're under stressful conditions like trial. So meditation helps. Just a breathing practice. You don't have to call it meditation. Just spend some time focusing on your breathing. I mean, if you do it right now, even on the podcast, and just stop and check in with your breathing, you'll notice after a while it'll get lower and slower and deeper. Just bringing awareness to it. Your body's like, oh, thank you for giving me a chance. That's really it. It's awareness of your breathing. Your body knows how to do it beautifully. It's just when we get it under stress, we start activating a higher rate of breathing what we really want to do is just slow that down. So that communicates a lot, a lot in terms of safety. It's I've got this, I've got you, I'm not a threat, you can trust me, without having to say any of those things verbally. That would be my safety tip. Okay. Things, but... And then once you have safety, then what's the next step? 
you said there were four, and I can't read my own handwriting. Engagement. Engagement. <laughs> engagement. Yeah. So, you know, for engagement, I think there's some really simple things to do. When, when we go back to the idea of how we're so unaware of what we're communicating non-verbally, I think one of the things that trial attorneys have to coming through our studio classes or working with me one-on-one, when they see the video, they're so surprised at how they look when they're listening. Because most of them, I just did a podcast myself on listening, and I said this, most of them look like a frozen statue, right? They're not moving, they're barely blinking, there's no nodding, and it's so hard to engage with a person that looks like that non-verbally. Now, I'll tell you the reason why most attorneys look like a frozen statue when they're listening in voir dire is because they're not listening. In, well, they're not listening to the jurors, at least. They're listening to their own inner monologue, and they're going, is that a good answer for me? Is that a bad answer? What do I do with that? <laughs> right? So they kind of freeze and their face looks frozen and the jurors have a hard time engaging with that. It doesn't look engaging, literally. And when we're talking about nonverbal communication, I think a lot of attorneys go, oh, that'd be nice, you know, to get better at that. And what I'm here to say is it's not that would be nice. I'm saying this is essential. I'm not saying that you can get by with being a great communicator and have shitty facts and, you know, your case be bad. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is if your case is good and you've got good facts, nonverbal communication will make all the difference. It's going to, like, take the ball over the line. And this is part of the reason is that so, so many of you stand in front of that group and you go, sorry, it's just so hard. They're, they won't talk to me. And I go, yeah, look at your nonverbals. You're hard to talk to. You don't look engaging. So we talk a lot about the nonverbals of listening. We talk about, first of all, how to get out of your head. And actually just to be with the juror and then to add the nodding and the eye contact and the good breathing and maybe make noises like mm, mm-hmm, that kind of thing. And then the jurors start to warm up and feel like they want to talk to you. I mean, we can tell jurors all day long, hey, I want you to talk to me. But if we don't communicate non-verbally that we mean it, they're always looking at what are we doing, not what are we saying. They're always going to look at actions over words. So that's a big part of engagement is actually bringing out the nonverbals of engagement so that they will talk to you. It's not just about your content. It's about how are you showing up. You know, one thing I learned that Trial Lawyers College has one great exercise that's called the listening exercise where mm. you go and you sit. I don't remember if you're back to back or you're looking at each other, but one person will talk and another person has, has to listen and then give back what that person was trying to say. And then they say, did you get it right or not? Mm-hmm. And what I have found it is so rare in life to have someone who actually is listening to what you're saying Mm -hmm. and trying to absorb it rather than trying to come up with what they're going to say next. Yeah, listening to talk. Mm -hmm. Uh, That it is so comforting. Uh, And then once you get that, it's like you go off to this ranch in Wyoming for weeks and you come back to the real world and to me, one of the biggest disconnects is that all these people you know and love don't really listen to you, and you're used to being listened to. <laughs> yeah. uh, and You've left the womb. No, and, and, it, and it, it's, a, uh, it's a slap in the face because it yeah. is so nice to have someone listen to you for once in life, and it's so rare. I think providing that is a great thing in our, in our trials. Well, and it's not just even a great thing. It's, it's, it's fundamental in terms of when I talk about the reason that jurors are hostages, I talk about the SCARF model, which is from David Rock's book, uh, Your Brain at Work. And he wasn't talking about jurors, but he's just talking in general about brain attacks and brain rewards. And so status is one of them, meaning if, if we elevate someone's status, the brain sees that as a reward. If we decrease their status or if there's a threat to their status, the brain sees that as an attack. Listening confers status, right? When you listen deeply to someone, you are saying you are important. So we can say all day long, you guys are the most important people in the room. And I hear that all the time. And then we will sit there and as the juror talks, our eyes will dart around the room or we look at the frozen statue and they're like, bullshit. You say I'm the most important person in the room, but you're not acting like I'm the most important person in the room. So it literally, listening well literally helps change jurors from hostage to hero because it tells them non-verbally, it shows them, I should say, they're important. Instead of you just saying, just using words, oh, you're important, it actually shows them that they are because you're conferring status on them. The other thing I've noticed with listening is it's so rare that the other lawyers in the case are Mm -hmm. listening. And Mm -hmm. so when they... People see that you're respecting them, you're listening to them, you're paying attention, you're not arguing, you're letting them speak, and respecting their words, even if you don't agree with them. Absolutely. And then the other person comes up and they ask these questions that are that have no aren't really questions like, does anyone here think just because you file a lawsuit that someone else should have to pay money? 
Right. Exactly. Uh, does anyone think that every wreck, no matter what, is always somebody's fault? You know, or, you know. I, I'm trying to think. They just ask yeah, some, no, it's some a statement questions. that you're asking them to agree with. Yeah. I mean, it's like you do understand. Great way to start a question. Yeah. <laughs> that it's not always appropriate for the police to use force, right? I mean, that's a great example. It's just I'm going to give you a statement and see if you agree with me or not. Yeah. And then when people do talk, because you know, I notice we get them warmed up, they want to talk, and 90% of the defense lawyers don't let them talk, and they no. cut them off, and they mm-hmm. deflect, and they don't listen, and it just creates this, okay, well, this person's not with us, yep. you know, and I think the there's a real advantage to being the human being who's listening in the room. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, again, it confers status. It, it makes you feel important. You know, when we talk about listening, uh, um, it's on my mind, again, because of the podcast I just did. There's really three levels. There's level one, which is listening to your own internal chatter. There's level two, which is the kind of listening that you're trained in, and all tra- trial attorneys, which is the really reflective listening, listening to the other person. But there's also level three, which is listening to what's not being said, listening to what's in the room, listening to the group, right? That's where all the good stuff in voir dire happens, is in level three, right? You you get to level three by doing good level two listening, right? You're, you're getting them to talk, and as they talk, you're accessing your level three going, what's not being said here? What do I need to ask next, right? That's your intuition speaking. We want to stay out of level one, you know, where we're like, well, this is, why do I wear the suit today? It looks bad, or <laughs> whatever we're thinking. But who should be in level one in voir dire? The jurors. We want them in their internal voice. And the number one way to get jurors into level one is for you to be in level two. You give them the gift of listening so that they will go inside and think and process and share that with you. That's why coaching and therapy works, right? Because your therapist or your coach is an intense level two, also with an eye on level three, that you can go in your level one and really process and think through all your stuff. That's what we want jurors to do. They'll never be able to do that if you're in your level one because you're not present. So why would they go deep? They're just kind of watching you going, what's this concrete statue doing? You've got to really focus on them so they feel safe enough to go inside. And that's where we get all the good stuff in what do. You've mentioned the scarf model. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is that? So that's from David Rock. And status is the first one for S. And then C stands for certainty. So that is, again, if there's a lot of certainty, people, the brain sees that as a reward. Brain loves certainty. If there's little to no certainty, that's a brain attack. A stands for autonomy. So the more we have freedom to make our decisions and to be in freedom, great. Brain loves that. Uh, Autonomy is restricted. That's a brain attack. Relatedness, the more we know the people around us and feel comfortable with them, that's a, a reward. We don't know people, that's an attack. And F stands for fairness. So if things feel fair, then brain is on board. If they don't, then attack. And so I was reading David's book. Again, it had, he doesn't even, I don't think he mentions jurors in there. But as I was reading the scarf model, this is years and years ago, I thought, oh my gosh, we ding jurors on every single one of these. We attack their status, right? Because we're going to make them speak in front of people. Uh, public speaking is number one fear. They don't have any status. They're told where to go and how long they have. Actually, they're not even told how long they have to be there. Just, just like, do what we say, right? So they have low, low status. Uh, no certainty. They don't know what this is about, why I'm here, how long I have to stay, any of that. No autonomy. That's the hostage part. They have to be there. No relatedness. They don't know you, the other jurors, the opposing counsel, the judge. They don't know anybody. And because of all that, the whole thing feels unfair. So that's another reason why jurors feel like hostages, because their brain is literally under attack. All five of those things are lighting up in the brain of this is an unsafe situation for me. So that's what the SCARF model is and how I apply it to jurors. And you talk about relatedness, and I've also heard you talk about, you know, just because you have a a number of people in a room doesn't mean you have a group. That's right. So how do you, what are some things we can do in jury selection to try to create a group and create relatedness? Groups are primarily, not completely, but primarily formed non-verbally. So when you think of an unformed group, for example, you can think of groups that, like, I gave you this example earlier, you know, you go to a national CLE, you don't know a lot of people there. If you take a look around the room, the group is primarily informed, right? No one's looking at each other. No one's really talking to each other. Maybe small groups, but not, not everybody together. People do things at different time, go get coffee, go to the restroom. Um, the breathing is a little anxious, like the feeling in the room is kind of anticipatory. That's an unformed group. And that's kind of what you have with jurors, right? 
Uh, jurors, even if they sit in that room for two hours or whatever, waiting to come out to the courtroom, if you pop your head in there, I bet you anything, no one's talking, right? They're all watching the stupid TV thing on or reading their magazines or looking at their phones. I, I actually remember flying out to Wisconsin to help um, an attorney choose a jury. And Monday morning and Sunday, we had to arrange for a mock jury. And we arrived late, an hour late. And we walk in and the attorney was stunned to find that all mock jurors are just sitting there in silence. They've been together for an hour and no one had started up a conversation. This is, this is what we face though in the courtroom. And so you have this very unformed group. So the way to form a group is to reverse those four factors. You've got to get jurors looking at each other. You've got to get them talking to each other. You have to get them doing things together and you have to get them breathing together. That's what starts to form the group. Any good host or hostess knows this at a dinner party, right? You don't just have everybody come over. In fact, I've been to those dinner parties and they're terrible. And the host never introduces you to anyone else. And there's this kind of awkward, you're standing around with your wine, a glass of wine. And you're like, I don't know anyone here. I don't know where they're at. A good host comes up and goes, do you know Michael? And then he allows you to make eye contact. You start talking to each other. And it just gets warmer and warmer and warmer until two or three hours later, everyone's feeling like they've been friends forever. Now, we obviously don't have wine. That would probably help in voir dire. Um, or that same kind of feeling, but you can do a lot of those things in voir dire to help the group start to form. Give us some examples. So for example, one of the things with eye contact is that people follow your eyes, not your hands. So oftentimes, like in opening, for example, you'll say, look up here, and you'll gesture over to a visual, but you'll keep looking at the jury. You immediately confuse the jury because they don't know what to do. You've said, look up here but you're still making eye contact. And we are so socialized in Western culture to continue to make eye contact that they just go with the nonverbal, right? So they keep looking at you and you're like, no, no, really, look up here. You keep looking at them, right? We can use this to our advantage though. So for example, if you say to a juror, and this is hard to do a podcast, but you gesture to a juror and you say, is what you're saying any different than, and then you gesture to a second juror, here's what will make the juror look at that second juror. You have to take your eyes and Look at the second juror, right? Most of you will stay with the first jury. Go, is what you're saying any different then? And you'll just go over to your left. This juror, and they'll just keep looking at you. The first juror will keep looking at you because you're making eye contact. But if you say, is what you're saying any different than this juror? And now you're looking over at the second juror. That first juror will follow your eyes because they want to, if you don't believe me, go to coffee with someone and start staring over their left shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be almost impossible for them not to turn and look. Oh, absolutely. At what the hell are you looking at? We just follow people's eyes. So the juror will immediately follow your eyes. And whether they actually look at the juror or not, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. But you've made it okay to look at the juror. And as you keep doing this, it just, they first need you to quote unquote nonverbally introduce them to each other. I mean, there's simpler ways too. You know how the... <laughs> The judge reads the list of the witnesses and asks all the jurors, you know, does anyone know anyone? He says, blah, blah. You can stand up. And I, I, an attorney told me this trick, and I don't remember who it was. So if you're listening, let me know because I want to give you credit because I think it's brilliant. He said, what about when you go stand up and say, you know, the judge asked you if you knew any of the witnesses. I'm interested. Do any of the jurors know any of the other jurors? Well, what do the jurors have to do? They have to turn around and look at each other. It's brilliant. Because once you look at someone the first time, it's less awkward after that. Now I can look at you more and more, right? That first time is the hardest time. Yeah. So as you start doing all these things where they just, and you start making it easier for them to look at each other, the group starts to form. It starts to get warmer and easier to talk. And you'll just find this. You're going to find this out tomorrow, Michael. Mm -hmm. It's just a magical thing. We have these little nonverbal cues when you're really clear about where you're looking and how you're gesturing. You start non-verbally introducing the jurors to each other and they start to identify and form as a group. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking, commercial motor vehicle, and product liability cases. If you have a case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. We would be honored to review the case in detail, discuss where we believe we can add value, and create a mutually beneficial partnership. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to podcast at triallawyernation.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail. And now, back to the show. We talked, you talked some about, I don't know about in the podcast, but when you and I have talked, been talking earlier today about issues versus relationships. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, I think that's the big difference in my voir dire than a lot of voir dires in terms of what you guys have been trained in is that um, I always train in my seminars outside of voir dire. I just say there are two buckets that every communication situation falls into. Every communication situation, whether you're ordering coffee, talking to your spouse, or you're in court. And that is you are either dealing with an issue or tending to the relationship. And many times you go back and forth. But those are the... The one of the, those two options is where you always are. What happens in court is that <laughs> jurors are in the issue bucket. No one gets a jury summons and they all goes, you know what? I cannot wait to get to the courtroom to have a relationship with Mr. or Mrs. Attorney today, <laughs> right? They just don't. They are like, why am I here and what do I have to do? That is their primary concern. And so when you understand that the way to get what I call permission. And I'm not talking about verbal permission, like do I have your permission to whatever. I'm talking about nonverbal receptivity. The number one way to get that with jurors or anyone else is to meet them where they are. So if you can accurately determine whether someone's in the issue bucket or the relationship bucket and then go there, permission starts to go up. Which is why when you start voir dire with let me talk about your hobbies or your passions. <laughs> you lose permission almost immediately because the jurors are like, what the hell does that have to do with anything? It's like, you don't get it, right? We don't want to be here. I don't want to talk about my hobbies and my passions. If you instead go to the issue, which you say, thank you for being here. This case is about a car crash. Boom, right there. That one sentence increases permission because they want to know why am I here and what do I have to do? So that's my big thing with issue versus relationship is that I help attorneys create an issue-oriented voir dire, meaning let's talk about the issues in the case because that's the one thing all the jurors have in common. That's the thing that's brought them here. If hobbies or passions come out somehow in that conversation, great. But when you start with relationship and jurors are in the issue bucket, you immediately mismatch. And that is a absolute recipe for disaster. What are some things you've seen lawyers do that hurt their cases? Well, being unaware of what they're communicating non-verbally is a big one. So, um, <laughs> as I say in the book, it's not like this is going to, you're going to do something non-verbally that will like, they're like, we were for you. And then you use this gesture and we were like, forget it. I mean, that's not going to happen, but it is the glue. I think that holds everything together. So for example, we talk about, I'll just use the voice pattern, but there's a whole body language thing to go along with this. We talk about the authoritative voice, which curls down the James Bond voice pattern. And this voice pattern, which I'm using right now, communicates authority. And then we have the approachable voice pattern, which is the more open and engaging voice pattern. It curls up at the ends of step sentences. And this is the um, Mr. Rogers voice pattern. Won't you be my neighbor? You have to have the timing down. And that can really get in your way. Because if you start your opening with the, author or the approachable voice pattern, you say, there's a rule in medicine that says, it sounds like you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And I've seen a lot, I've seen a brilliant appellate lawyer argue well, but use that voice pattern and not get her message across. On the flip side, you come into a voir dire with the authoritative voice pattern. You do understand that it's not always, you know, whatever your question is. And then the jurors are like, mm-hmm. And they just don't want to <laughs> talk to you, right? So I think... The nonverbals are not going to make or break your case, but they're certainly going to support your message. When you're saying something important and one-way communication, you guys really got to get this. It needs to be authoritative, both in voice pattern and body language. If you're wanting to engage the jury with you and get them talking, you've got to change your approachable. And immediately people think, say, well, you know, I don't want to be inauthentic. Listen, I've never in all the time I've been doing this met someone who is totally authoritative or totally approachable. Everybody has both. Everybody does. And communication is all about timing. So when do you bring forth one and when do you bring forth the other? The general rule of thumb is you want to use authoritative when you're sending information. And you want to use approachable when you're seeking information. That's the general rule of thumb. And when you get that right, it makes a difference because, again, jurors are looking more at what you do than what you say. So if you communicate with authority, you don't have to say, I'm really authoritative and credible. Right? You show them that you're authoritative and credible. 
And when you communicate approachable, approachably, you don't have to say, hey, I'm really approachable. You can talk to me. You show them that you're approachable, and then they, then they, then they engage with you. And that's not just in talking to jurors. It's in talking to witnesses. Absolutely. Like if you're in a deposition and you want someone to spill their guts, mm-hmm. well, then you want to use an approachable voice. Absolutely. Like, now, what else happened? Well, what do I need to know? Yeah. If you're in cross-examination. Tell me more. Tell me more. Yeah. And you want to say, like, this is the role, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You wrote that role, didn't you? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a totally different... Well, as Randy McGinn says, cross-examination is when you get to testify right. <laughs> and get them to agree with you. So, yeah, you're going to use an authoritative voice there. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've had people say, well, that's not a question. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm asking whether you agree with my statement or not. That's <laughs> my question. That's exactly uh, right. We don't want to do that in voir dire, but in cross-examination, no, not at all, we absolutely do. Yeah. Almost, usually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I can think of one cross-examination question I did that my partner at the time almost killed me. Because uh, I had a, a doctor who was not going to answer a question that I asked and mm-hmm. was going to give a speech and everyone. So this was probably insane, but it really worked. I said, it seems like you have something you really want to tell this jury. Mm-hmm. And it seems like you're not going to answer any of my questions until you get to tell it. So I'll make you a deal. If I ask you the one question, what do you want to tell this jury? And sit down and let you talk for as long as you want when you answer my questions. Nice. <laughs> and... Uh, he totally dug his own grave. Of course. <laughs> he talked about how he opened a, a clinic in this poor area of town because he wanted to help the poor area that our, people like our expert at Harvard couldn't understand these people. And yeah, he hired foreign doctors, but you know they were more understanding of the immigrant community, even though the, the doctor came from Egypt and this was a Mexican American immigrant community. Uh, and then totally let me go into the fact that all these people had Medicaid. And he was making money, but it was very low margin. The less he paid a doctor, the cheaper it would be. And a doctor from Egypt who failed the test three times before she could pass it would be a lot cheaper than someone who went to Harvard. Mm-hmm. And he started yelling and screaming at me and got really upset, and we won the case. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes our most insane ideas are the ones that pay off. But, but it was one of those, it was a, a feeling in the courtroom. And, you know, if I'm trying to force words into this talk, I mean, I'm going to lose that battle. Mm-hmm. But then when I let him dig his own grave. But yeah. a lot of it had to do with... The difference, when I asked him, I had to ask them that in a tone and a body language to let the jury think, I'm fine with whatever this guy has to say, mm-hmm. and I'm actually curious to hear what it is. Right, right. And you aren't personally attached. I mean, going back to our original idea is that I see so many attorneys get angry on cross examine It just doesn't help you at all. It, no. it, you let them hang themselves. The minute that you get angry on cross exam or anywhere else, what you're communicating to the jury is this is personal. And what you're asking them now to do is toward not your client, but you a verdict and no jury on the universe is going to personally award you a verdict. So keep your emotions out of it. The other thing is we have had people on the other side doing and saying things to us for a year or two. And we have all this backstory that builds up this when they say something and, and and it makes us furious Mm -hmm. and it hurts us. But the jury hasn't been along for that journey. And they just see, they just see you getting mad, and that means that, oh, that person must have, they might not even understand what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. But if you got mad, they must have got you. Yep. You must have a problem with your yep. case. Yeah, they've, they've hit a hot button. Uh, uh-oh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so get some therapy, get some coaching, <laughs> figure that shit out before you get in the courtroom. But you got, you are the, you know, I remember an attorney once said, yeah, but sorry, they make me so mad because we're defending the truth. And I said, listen, you are not defending the truth. The truth needs no defense. You are a messenger of truth. And for a, to be a messenger, you have to be clear and calm. And boy, she said, I have never forgotten that you said that. Yeah, you want the jury to get angry. You get angry. Absolutely. Just not I, you know, great attorney here in Portland, John Coletti, he's an inner circle member. I think he's the youngest inner circle member. And he said that, you know, the reason I don't get angry is because it takes away from the anger that the jurors have. It sucks it out of the room. They, there needs to be space for them to get angry. When I get angry, I take up all that space. I think that's so, so true. It's like if you beat up a witness, the jury doesn't need to do anything. You already beat them up. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing I've heard you talk about that was really, actually one of the reasons that I flew halfway across the country to meet with you. Uh, <laughs> I'm so thrilled. Is, uh, is mindset. And you talked about it a little bit, but the... What the story in our mind about the story in the jury is going through the jury's mind? Yeah, well, I think mindset in general in my work is huge because, as I say, body language starts in the brain. Okay, so I can help you do this stuff with your hands and stand this way and this, you know, all that stuff. But that's like the cherry on the Sunday, right? That's just the skill work, and, and the skill work only works if it's aligned with the mindset work. 
Meaning, if you are walking in to the jury and you're viewing them as the enemy and that they're, these are all these people that are out to get you, but you're non-verbally trying to communicate how open you are and how you want them to trust you, that's incongruent and it will show up. There's no way you can hide that unless you're a psychopath, right? And I'm hoping and assuming that you're not. So for me, getting the mindset correct is more important than the skill work. In fact, I start there a lot. You were here that from today. I've kind of nailed you on a couple of things, Michael, that you said is like, whoa, wait a minute, what's that story? Because we communicate based on our stories. And that's why I'm coach and consultant, because I think the skills are empty on their own. They are there to support you. All the nonverbal things I teach all my attorneys are there to support the healthy mindset that you should have going in in the first place, which is... Not that every juror out there is going to be perfect for your case, but that you're coming with an open mind and with some curiosity and you're looking for who you want on instead of who you want to kick off. I mean, the idea of the exclusionary uh, voir dire is, uh, to me, is ridiculous, is that let me kick everybody off that is bad for me and then just make do with every, anybody else. In no other profession in the, in the universe is that create a good team and basketball teams football. nobody's like let's get rid of all the bad players and just see who who who's left we're looking for the best players we go scouting right i mean i'm not a sports person so i hope i'm using the right you are. terms here <laughs> but they scout for the best players so they could put their best game on why on earth would we not do that same thing with jurors we should go in there and be armed with information you know i just spent the morning doing that in the case of yours with exactly what our good juror looks like. And I don't mean demographics. I mean, what beliefs does this person hold? What is their worldview? And call those people forth. Because what you focus on, you expand. What you focus on, you create. Go in there looking for bad apples. That's what you're going to find. Go in there and look for people who want on to help you win this thing. You'll find them too. So which one do you want? That's what you've got to decide as a trial attorney. And I know that everyone is going to say, yeah, but the bad ones are killing your case. My method doesn't exclude. I mean, when you're looking for the good ones, you'll find who the bad ones are. In fact, I think you'll find them easier. I, I really do. But your your focus is different, and it creates an absolutely different environment. It, can, it just The level three changes. It just everything gets easier when you come in going, I'm looking for a team. Where are you? Where are you? And I think if you go in there with the mindset that, there are people out there that are trying to screw me, and they're not. I'm not going to win no matter what. Mm-hmm. That that that's going to communicate. You're Absolutely. you're going to create what's in your mind, even if it wasn't there before. Whereas if you go in there with positive, these are good people. You know, I can respect them. If the evidence is there, they're going to help me. Well, if you're wrong, you're wrong. You're going to lose anyway. But right. at least you're not turning anybody off. And what I found, you know, is just. You know, you see it so much in the political divide. It's one of the problems we have in our politics today is there's just an assumption that anyone who disagrees with you is evil and stupid, mm-hmm. or both. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, it, it, and it absolutely prevents any reaching across the aisle and getting anything done. Whereas if you can go in there with a mindset, uh, and I'm blessed to have a lot of friends on both sides, mm-hmm. there's perfectly wonderful people that I disagree with on a lot of things, but it doesn't mean there aren't common areas. Like, absolutely. And most people I found on, you know, pretty far right if there are a lot of civil cases with you find jurors mm-hmm. as long as you treated them with respect mm-hmm. absolutely and frankly a lot of people on the left who also are wonderful people and are great on social justice issues and frankly aren't that much on compensating individual people absolutely yeah. absolutely I mean I think that's a great example as you know when I first got on this work I kept hearing this story over and over again conservative jurors can't be trusted conservative jurors are the worst all without ever asking a question of our conservative jurors in the particular case that we were dealing with you walk in with a story like conservative jurors can't be trusted, you better believe that's going to communicate, right? You find one in, the, in there. You can't not communicate that. If instead you walk in with who here is, is helpful for my case, regardless of what they are. I'm not saying that, you know, tort reform hasn't affected a bunch of the conservative populations. I'm not saying to be blind to these things. What I'm saying is you set the tone. You do. You get to decide what this feels like and how this, the experience is for jurors. And when you walk in with the mindset of who's out here to get me, most people, you know, I've seen cases, for example, that one on a wing and a prayer, right? I mean, the, the, they just, the, the stuff is, the, the facts aren't great because the attorney was so confident and so in love with their case 
that wins the hearts and minds of jurors. So go in, being in love with your case, looking for your team members. This doesn't mean you won't throw off the ones that aren't shouldn't be there. But it's all about which door do you walk in. It's like if you go on, a, let's go back to your first internet dating. You go on the first coffee date and all, let's say the guy just talks about how all women cheat yeah. and they're heartbreakers. He's been hurt and, before. And, yeah, yeah, you've been hurt before and trash talking your couple last exes. You know, mm-hmm. you're probably not going to go out for something else after that. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Such you can really example. turn somebody off. And I think that that's kind of, you know, we're trying to form relationships. First, you know, you have to go in there with a mindset of I'm someone we're people that want to have a relationship with each other. It's a blank slate. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I, again, jurors will never be known until we get to know them. Yeah. So we come in with these preconceived notions about anybody, not just jurors, and you've already tainted the experience. It's hard to do. I mean, the brain loves stories because it helps us make sense. It's, it's a shortcut, right? And as much as I love my brain's efficiency, those shortcuts can sometimes get us in trouble. We've got to go into voir dire with a sense of curiosity and wonder and, and really get to know even the bad jurors uh, and, and keep everything neutral and open and not be scared of what, what we're getting in there. And that just creates a whole different experience and for it, both you and the jurors. And it changes the story in our own minds before we walk in the courtroom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're able to see things that now that you weren't able to see before. You know, how we label things affects how we view them. I'll never forget, you know, we, uh, I'm 100% Finn. We go to Finland every other year. We're going to be heading off in another couple of weeks. And we were coming back to fly back home, and the day before, well, I should say this, we, we are in the security line. I think we were in Denmark and Sweden, one of those. And it said on there, you know, as most of those security lines, you know, no weapons, no guns, no knives, whatever. And I literally remember turning to Kevin and saying, my husband Kevin, I said, who would be so stupid to try to take, in today's day and age, try to take a weapon through security? So our bags go through security. And the person comes over and she says, ma'am, is this your bag? And I said, yeah. And he goes, I'm going to have to open it. And I said, why? And he said, because you have a knife. I said, I do not have a knife. And I proceeded to watch him take a knife out of my bag. And that's when I recognized that I had bought a fishing knife slash umavol pick to get the bones out. Yeah. But in my mind, I had label, labeled that souvenir. It didn't even enter my mind because I put the label souvenir on it. Not I just what, packed it with all the souvenirs. And then, of course, it's a weapon. But because I closed my mind off to that because I'd already labeled it. And so the minute we do that with jurors, we don't see any other opportunities. We just go, I label you. I'm done with you. And they may be great for us, but we can't see it. It's amazing what people will do for you when you approach things with a positive attitude. And I've got my own uh, TSA story. So Delisi and I are flying on a, on a plane. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we got to go like, like six in the morning to go clear security, and we were we arrived separately. Mm-hmm. And I had printed her boarding pass, and I guess she ended up printing her own. And so I'm talking. I show him my ID. I show him what I thought was my boarding pass. I he writes on it. I go through, go through security. I get on the plane, and all of a sudden, at least at time, we both were looking at. We both have the same seat number because I had. An idea that said Michael Cowan. I showed him a boarding pass that said Delisi Friday. Oh, funny! And got through security, got okay. checked to the plane, and they were going to give my seat away. Luckily, I got up, had to fight the line coming in, and tell the flight attendant they checked me out the wrong boarding pass. I'm oh, actually wow. Michael Cowan in the next seat. Yeah. Uh, but I think because I was just talking to the guy, like I'm not doing that wrong. I'm, right. He didn't even notice the name of my boarding pass. <laughs> But I'm sure that if I was nervous, sure, because I have a cousin uh, who was in the military. Uh, and he speaks Farsi, mm-hmm. uh, is what he learned to speak. He says he can tell whether someone is bad or not. Now I'm a high this. He goes, give me three questions. Mm-hmm. And they're like, who are you? Where are you going? Who are you going to do? Go? Who are you going to see or something? I mean, like mm-hmm. real basic questions. Yeah. And it wasn't the words. It's the way they answer. He could tell whether or not you're up to no good most of the time. Unless you're really, really right. practiced or a psychopath. But right. Most people, you know, if you're doing something wrong, will get nervous. But I think it's the same way if you approach someone like, you're out to get me. I'm I'm scared of you. Mm-hmm. I think you're a bad person. I'm trying to I'm trying to find you out. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you're going to turn everybody off. Well, Dan and Chip Heath in their book Made to Stick say the way that you deliver a message is a message to the person on how they should respond. Yeah. So if you're aggressive, they'll respond with aggression, right? So again, you set the tone. What tone do you want to set with yours? And again, let go of your fear. And see these people as hostages in need of being freed. And once you do that, I mean, the the thing about my method, the four steps, is that at each step, you offer them a choice. 
So in the first step, the safety choice, once you provide safety, jurors, and choice is the one thing jurors don't have, right? So jurors have the, the choice to remain, to be, to stay there and be like, okay, I'm not going to try to escape, right? Once you have, give them, get them engaged, they now have the choice to participate, right? They're like, okay, well, I'm staying and I'm, in, I'm kind of interested. When we get to commitment, now they get the choice to commit to your case and to say, yeah, I actually, I, I think I, I'm on this guy's side or gal's side. And then they have the choice to take action, right? So each choice builds on the other choice. You can't just go right to action. You can't just go, will you marry me at the very right. beginning? You've got to slowly get them out of the hostage mode. Then you got to get them interested. Then you have to give them enough information so that they can actually now make an actual choice. And now they have to actually go do the job. And that's the action piece. They can't take action until you've done all the other steps. I think it's so funny. Yeah, every emotional limit I ever get in they, they no commitment questions in voir dire. You can't, you know, ask someone to commit to what they're going to do. And I'm like, why would I want to do that? Absolutely. <laughs> that Absolutely. wouldn't work. I mean, yeah. people are going to resent you if you ask them to make a commitment without the facts. Mm-hmm. Not, suddenly, because you trick them, now they're not going to go back on it, you know. Absolutely. And it's all, it's all about timing, right? That's why, you know, do jurors need to be empowered? Yes. Not in voir dire. It's too early. They need to be empowered in closing, right? Do jurors need information? Yes. That doesn't happen in voir dire. That happens in opening. It, it's all about doing things in the right time and in the right context. I love this, but unfortunately, you know, we have a, a, a time limit how long we can have a podcast, <laughs> and I selfishly get to talk to you for the next the rest of the day and all day tomorrow, too. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, But one thing I do want to do, you, we know you have a book coming out. Yes. Uh, what else do you do? If people want to learn more about you or maybe work with you, what, what do you do and how can people learn more about you? So there are a couple ways to work with me. We are um, developing an online course to go with From Hostage to Hero. As you might imagine, writing about nonverbal communication is not the best way to learn about it. So if you get the book and you are interested in learning more, that would be the first place I would direct you to is from hostage to hero.com. There'll be some free videos on there demonstrating some of the skills in the book. But then once the online course opens, I believe in January, you can become part of that membership with a lot of other trial attorneys where you'll get training from me online in the skills. And that's January 2020? Yes. Just because this thing's going to be online for years and people might be Yes, back January 2020. 2020 and we will open that um, course slash membership only about four times a year. So you're going to want to get on our email list whenever you're listening to this podcast and go, oh, I want to be a part of that. Go to fromhostagehero.com and, and you'll see whether the course is open at that time. And the reason we do that is because we want to really take the new members through and get them oriented. And I, you know, I want to keep that small as we keep going and then you know, we'll, we'll let in some new members. So that's the real easy way to first get involved. If you've got um, a case coming up, you can just contact us at sorrydlm.com. That's just my regular website. And you can come out like you. I have come out for a couple days. Normally two to three days is the norm. And we'll take you through voir dire and opening or one or the other, get you in front of a mock jury, and really work the nonverbal communication piece. If you want to do that in a group format, we have our studio classes. Uh, hopefully in 2020, we'll still be doing those. We may be changing that up. But for now, we've got our voir dire studio. It's a four-day seminar with only six attorneys, a small group, two mock juries where you're learning all these skills that I've been talking about, and then an opening statement studio, which is all about the presentation skills and the storytelling skills. And that's a really great way to dip your toe into this work. You come out, you're with me for four days, five other attorneys, you learn from each other, and you get the whole videotape, and it's a, it's a really good time. Um, so that's another way, if you've got a trial coming up, is to apply for a studio class and come out and work, and work with a couple of other trial attorneys and get some good work down that way. And you have your podcast as well. I do have a podcast from Hostage to Hero. You can find that on iTunes, Spotify, absolutely, and getting some good reviews on that. So we're excited about that. Well, great. Well, I've really enjoyed talking to you. I'm looking forward to continuing to work with you today and tomorrow, and I uh, can't wait to read your book when it comes out. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our show. If you're listening to this episode on a mobile device, please click on Ratings and Review and leave our show a five-star rating and write a review. And if you're listening to this episode from our website, please leave a five-star rating on the episode page. We'd love to reach more listeners, and doing this will help more attorneys find this podcast. You can also visit our website at www.triallawyernation.com to opt into our mailing list so you can stay updated on our new episodes. I promise we won't spam you. And thanks to your feedback, we've improved our podcast website. There's now a resources tab that you can click that shows you all the books we've mentioned on our podcast. If you have a Facebook account, please send us a request to join our private group called Trial Lawyer Nation 
Insider Circle. This exclusive group will allow you to hear about our guests before an episode airs, interact with the show, and get a sneak peek at some of the behind the scenes moments. I love to hear from all of you, and our Table Talk episodes are based solely on questions from our fans. So please continue to send us emails at podcast at triallawyernation.com. Thanks for tuning in, and I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking, commercial motor vehicle, and product liability cases. If you have a case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. We would be honored to review the case in detail, discuss where we believe we can add value, and create a mutually beneficial partnership. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to podcast at triallawyernation.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our hosts, guests, or contributors and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.